So, uh, good to talk to you guys today. This is uh, Friday. What is it? The uh, 27th. We're going to go ahead and get started. Today is going to be mostly about a conversation between myself and Janice regarding how to manage groceries and Amazon packages when, you, when we come in. As, uh, if you've seen many of my videos, you know that Janice and I haven't exactly agreed on everything, but... Uh, as we continue to go through this process, we get closer and closer to uh, negotiated agreements. And we'll maybe you'll see some of that during the debate, I mean, uh, discussion today. Before we do that, well, I'm gonna basically do some uh, brief introduction. Uh, the US is now the epicenter. Uh, we overtook New Orleans, uh, um, I mean, we overtook um, Italy and um, we'll get into that in just a minute. I'll also give some brief comments about signs and symptoms, pink eye, anosmia, what is that? Can't smell, um, and lung x-rays. Very, very common uh, look at inflammation with this virus in the lungs. It's just that even though kids have this uh, evidence of inflammation in their lungs, they're just not having many symptoms. We'll talk about that again. A uh, couple more items on introduction, and then we'll talk about um, groceries and Amazon packages. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, FAQ, uh, test results interpretations. We covered those a couple of days ago. We know we've had a lot of comments and interest in uh, supplements and especially vitamin C. We plan to, uh, to cover that again a little bit more deeply over the next uh, week or so. Just one technical comment. As you know, Zoom went down on us last week. Yesterday, YouTube went down on us. Uh, as you, if you went back and, and played the last five minutes of the video, it was clear that um, YouTube was crashing. Uh, and it wasn't us, it was, or, and it wasn't uh, Screencast or Screenyard or whatever software we're using now. Guess what? the whole world is getting uh, accustomed to the idea of living remotely. So Zoom and, all, and YouTube and a lot of these are just not quite used to the surge of activity that's going on. So very, very briefly, a global update, 327, US is now the epicenter. We overtook the number two uh, country, Italy, uh, yesterday, and the number one country, China, all in one day, which as I was watching it, I was afraid that was gonna happen. Uh, as you see from this global trend, we are clearly not in a phase of flattening this curve. We've got a major hockey, hockey stick uh, increase. Uh, for In terms of the US, um, New York is a major epicenter. LA is growing quickly. If you look at a couple of, I think Janice told me a couple of the uh, the counties that we know in the uh, in the U.S. that are number one and number two, New Orleans, you know, New Orleans and their party, and let's say Le Bon Ton Roule. For those of you that don't have a New Orleans culture, that means let the good times roll, and they did that, and they're regretting it. I'm showing you my shirt. This is a pearly shirt. Janice and I lived in New Orleans for a couple of years. I interned at Charity Hospital there. It was a fun experience, especially for a young adult couple. Uh, but again, New Orleans is paying the price for all that partying right now. Um, the other area that we know that is appears to be number two is Staten Island. We have friends in Staten Island and uh, Janice had to do some uh, counseling and consulting with folks about now's not a good time to go out grocery shopping, especially if, uh, if you're not 
15 or 20 or 30 years old, if you're 60s, 70s, and 80s. So again, things don't look good right now. And just like that frog who's looking down the gullet of the heron, things didn't look good for him. Just like these two seals, uh, one was looking down the, the gullet of uh, a, a pot of orcas. The other one was looking down the gullet of this great white. Um, but they didn't give up. One of them jumped in the boat and avoided the orcas. The, uh, the baby seal kept flipping around and, and going to the other end of the, uh, of the shark. So you may think that things are really, really miserable, that, but they're not. A actually, the reality is I live in this world where uh, as a species, humans tend to ignore warnings, just like we've ignored all the warning signs of COVID happening. And just like we ignore every day, the signs of heart attack and stroke, number one cause of uh, death, number one cause of disability, what uh, a Vietnam war every two months. And even though these are very preventable, the vast majority of these are preventable, as a culture, we seem to think that all this death, destruction and disability is okay. Well, it's not we will continue to learn our lesson as a species. Quick PPE update, early signs of uh, demand and supply beginning to balance out. I say that from my own activities with uh, the national testing program that we're getting started. Um, we're getting people uh, calling up and saying, you know what, I got, I got 10 million masks uh, coming out of China. I've got a, a million, um, uh, test kits or half a million test kits coming out of South Korea. And then well, <laughs> one of the uh, procurement uh, officers with this group was actually a, uh, a uh, general in the army uh, in charge of procurement and logistics in uh, Afghanistan. And he was, he was telling us last night, he said, this sort of reminds me of one time when we were amazed to find the number of specialized uh, uh, vehicle transportation trucks. And then as we began to look at all these different pictures, we began to realize it was all the same truck with different magnetic signs put on the doors. So there's a lot of that going on too. The same things are being, being quote sold, uh, end quote, multiple times. You're going to have that. But again, rather than escalating it, this uh, PPE and a supplies issue does uh, show some early signs of starting to, uh, to equil equilibrate out. Part of that is its um, development of N95 masks and uh, gowns and other PPE are becoming a cottage industry in Kentucky and other places in this country. Uh, groups are like Duke are getting uh, creative and sterilizing and reusing N95 masks. A lot of interesting stuff going on in this sp space. I can tell you this, I don't think that, again, as a species, that we're gonna be dependent on having only three locations for sources for N95 masks in the future. And you say, well, that doesn't matter because we need it now for this outbreak. This is probably not gonna be the last, uh, the last out, well, we know that. We have outbreaks every year of the flu, we have, uh, we will continue to have this kind of stuff. We're just going to get a lot better at managing it. Maybe we'll start listening to some things. Signs and symptoms. Just a couple of comments about that space. Anosmia, very, very common. What is it? Well, it's loss of sense of smell. And again, very common right now um, as a, uh, a presenting symptom of uh, this bug. In fact, Anosmia, con conjunctivitis or pink eye, and fever, the three most common things that you see. Uh, fever is maybe not as common as you think. You see it in about 30% of adults. It appears to be higher in children. Uh, interesting component, and it may be a, a, an interesting clue regarding the relative strength of the immune systems and how kids versus adults manage this. You may remember I did a a video on the uh, the description of the first what thousand or thirteen hundred cases of kids in Wuhan, and the bottom line is that none of them ended up in ICU. 
except for three. And these three were, were in the ICU for other reasons, like leukemia, um, very serious life-threatening kidney disease, life-threatening disease of the small intestine. Those diseases were, were what put these kids in the ICU, not COVID-19. So uh, again, some good news that we've, we've heard before, at least the next generation is not getting hit with this as bad. You may have heard a couple of times about ground glass. Uh, it's very common to see what we call ground glass on the x-ray. And why is it called that and what does it mean? Well, number one, even in children who, as I just said, are not ending up in the ICU, it's very common to see this, what we call ground glass appearance in the chest x-ray. Um, here's an, a normal chest x-ray and here's that quote ground glass. There is no ground glass in there. What's happening is you've got inflammation. And it's, this is demonstrating that we are getting significant inflammation in the lungs. And it's even very, very common with kids, even though, again, the kids are not ending up in the ICU with this. So that helps you understand what's going on with this virus in the body. It's clearly caused, very commonly causing uh, lower uh, respiratory tract inflammation. It's just uh, the elderly and, uh, and adults and people with some significant risk factors like high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, um, lung disease, smoking. Those are the folks that are having problems getting over this very common condition of lung inflammation with this. So as a, a um, Next, we'll go to a conversation with myself and Janice and talk a little bit about maybe some of the practical aspects of, um, of grocery shopping. But before we do, there was a doc in Grand Rapids, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, he was picked up by Grand Rapids TV. His name is Jeffrey Van Wingen. His uh, video went, uh, pun, uh, pardon the pun, went viral. Uh, and here's a few things he said. He said, look, I'm applying sterile technique to groceries. Sterile technique's what we use in surgery and doing procedures on patients. One of the things he said to do is stage your groceries for three days. In other words, leave your groceries out in uh, the garage or someplace else to let these uh, viruses that may be on the outside die. Remove the food where possible from con potentially contaminated containers. Um, and put it in other containers that you have in the house that are, um, that you know are sterile or more sterile. Imagine your, your, uh, that this food and, and, and the stuff that you've bought, the packages are covered with glitter. And the goal is to get the packages, the contents of the packages out and into your uh, home and end this process with none of that glitter on the floor none of it on your hands, especially none of that glitter on your face, and clearly none of that glitter on your tabletops and your countertops. Uh, when you're in the grocery, he said, commit to purchase before handling. In other words, don't do what we often do, pick, pick up something and look at it and read the, uh, read the contents, think about it, and then put it down. Obvious, but uh, again, great reminder. And of course, don't go for groceries if you're elderly or sick or you have uh, some of these risk factors. Figure out another way to, to get those groceries home. One of the things that Janice and I both have begun to agree on is don't shop for groceries three days a week. Don't get deliveries from Amazon three days a week. Don't, I mean, you can shop for groceries. I'm still saying once a month. I think Janice is still at, at every two weeks, but we'll cover that in the discussion in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> after uh, Clyde gives you the, uh, the water ball, and we'll get started. Go ahead, Clyde. So Clyde, can you see us in here? Should I stop sharing? Yes, Doc, I can see you. There we go. 
So here's my lovely bride. Uh oh, one thing. You know what, Clyde? You may want to take that banner off the bottom. Janice is seated. I'm usually standing, and then that banner is covering her face, if that's possible. So. Yep, it's all good, Doc. It's all good. Great. So my lovely bride, Janice, you've appeared a few times on the on the channel. When was the last time you appeared? Was that during the? Um, was that when we had that vaccine? Uh, I think we did a CBD oil. Oh yeah, that's right. We did do a CBD oil. In fact, speaking of which, I was talking to a patient yesterday. He's lost weight. He's done great. Uh, one of the uh, Louisville patients, and I, I asked him how his sleep was going. He said, "Actually, it's going great." And I said, "Well, good." why? And he said, well, I'm taking the CBD oil uh, three times a week. Is that okay? And I said, I hope so. I'm taking it every day. <laughs> so uh, do you want to give us some of your thoughts about, uh, or maybe, maybe replay some of the debates that you and I've had about grocery shopping and uh, well, I'm going to read the Amazon. I'm going to read the title of the New York Times article from yesterday. Who knew grocery shopping could be so stressful? Pushing a shopping cart, braving crowded aisles, and even unpacking bags feels perilous. Well, up, it is. Up to this point, my major source, source of anxiety about shopping has been my own husband. <laughs> <laughs> Who early, really, we started social isolating. I started on March 9th, and he was three days ahead of me. But he also told me then he strongly urged that I did not shop more than once every two weeks. And even when I went out, he was quite unsettled about it. Um, but that did really raise that to my awareness quite a bit ahead of the curve of other people realizing it. And so now as a health coach, it's one of the behaviors that I am actually coaching with patients in terms of, um, as you mentioned, people that are at higher risk, like the elderly or have immunosuppression. Um, do you want me to speak about that a little bit? I think that's great. I think that's one of the things that you're seeing, you know, right at the right up front in terms of therapy. So in terms of behaviors, you know, everybody has their own personal behavior around shopping. Um, we typically go to one store that is within walking distance of our house. And occasionally I'll go to um, another one. I typically go to Kroger and on occasion I'll go to Trader Joe's or Whole Foods. But a lot of people do shop in multiple stores on a weekly basis. And that's where people have to start rethinking that behavior. And, you know, there's reasons for doing it. There's products that they like better at another store. It could be pricing. It could be the freshness of the fruits and vegetables. There's all kinds of reasons to have this multi-store shopping. But if you think about it now as a um, making a healthy lifestyle choice, which is really, um, you know, you could say this is life or death choices, to not get out there amongst not just the people that are sick, but the people that are asymptomatic and don't know they have the virus. And there's a lot more of those than the people that have been identified due to lack of testing. So what I have um, coached um, some of our patients about is, especially if it's a couple or if it's one person, if it's a couple, you have to get together and create a grocery list. And, um, you know, because different people are on different diets in our business, you know, have different preferences. So you have to create one list and then look at that list that maybe would have taken you to three stores in the past and decide which store is most likely to have all of those products. And also, if you're going to shop, and not go out more than once every two weeks, you have to shop for more, but it's also not that hoarding that some people have done, you know, overwhelming the grocery store. Um, because we know that stores are still getting deliveries of food. Yes, the warehouses were empty with that original rush, but now the food, is, the food and even um, the paper goods are becoming more available. 
So I do have other thoughts about that, but if you want to make it more question and answer, I can go that way too. Well, I will, uh, you brought up several items. One of the things you brought up was lifestyle and different components of different lifestyle. I created a, a several different lifestyle lists uh, on a slide a couple of days ago to, to make the point about some of the overlap that we see. There are key components. Number one, lifestyle is more important than supplements. It's more, uh, and I know a lot of supplement, a lot, I'm going to get a lot of haters when I say that, but it's true. You can't supplement your way out of a lifestyle. You can't medicate your way out of a lifestyle. You can't surgerize or procedurize your way out of a lifestyle. And lifestyle is, there's a lot of overlap, but there's some significant differences depending on the disease as well. For example, we know with chronic disease, heart attack and stroke, um, there's some key lifestyle issues. Uh, diet, diet and diet. Then exercise, different types of exercise, uh, different components in terms of macronutrients with diet. Um, obesity is a big issue for most of the, um, the different lifestyle components. As you begin to start looking at other lifestyle, uh, other diseases, again, a lot of overlap with COVID-19 obesity is a big, big issue, big risk factor. So therefore diet's a big risk factor. But one of the items that, that comes out and goes right to the top that you don't see in um, lifestyle for kidney disease, lifestyle for heart attack and stroke. With COVID, you see social distancing. And so this is a new number one major component of lifestyle that we just not have gotten a chance to wrap our heads around yet as a culture. Uh, we don't think about that. I mean, Janice and I have talked many times and we always looked at each other when we're in church and it gets to that early part of the church service where the pastor says, well, will you shake hands with everybody around you? And we always would want to say, no, we don't. And so, <laughs> we don't want to, <laughs> but uh, up until very recently, uh, we tended to go ahead and bite the bullet. Um, hopefully things, uh, things like that will begin to change as we start wrapping our head around some of the different types of uh, lifestyles that we need to have. Another lifestyle that you may not think about, um, I, again, it's because of some of the work that I did back at Hopkins, HIV and AIDS related diseases. You know, you had all, a lot of those same things in terms of uh, maintaining health, <laughs> diet, things like that. But right up at the top was safe sex. Again, each one of these lifestyle components, we have to start thinking about. I mean, each one of these disease clusters, we have to start thinking about lifestyle and what are the key components of that lifestyle that we need to be focusing on. And today is a new lifestyle focus that we need to have. Right. It's a big learning point. Yes, yeah, so social distancing um, is probably one of the major lifestyle um, folk focus for today in the right. midst of this virus. And I can tell you from just even walking in my neighborhood, um, people are not trying to stay six feet apart. So when it comes back to grocery shopping, of course, some of the things that you can do is shop during the low volume hours. And now um, certain stores have hours for seniors an hour before the store opens to others. But even thinking about the size of the store in the in the space gives you an idea if you're going to be more spread out or in closer contact in more narrow aisles. Um, you were talking this morning about a couple of you heard a couple of stores that are actually marking off six foot six foot mm -hmm. increments in their um, checkout line. Right. That's interesting. Where was that? Was it well, Trader I, Joe's? I'm not sure if it was the checkout line or even to get in the door because people are lining up early for the senior mm -hmm. hours. And so they're spacing six feet. There's so many different ways they're doing it. And I'm sure it varies by region of the country too. Um, other things people are doing are having pick, you know, having what we have here at Kroger called click lists where they shop for you and then you pick it up curbside. But at least in other parts of the country, they deliver as well. Um, but in some of these hot spots of the virus, the deliveries are so overwhelmed that 
they're not taking in any more people to deliver to. So that's these choices are becoming more limiting. And if you've shopped on Amazon, which I did a week ago or 10 days ago, I went to our grocery. My goal was to get in and get out as quickly as possible. I went when it opened at eight, which I think now it's open at seven. I thought about going to the pharmacy to get some regular vitamins, et cetera. I thought about going to housewares and I thought I really want to focus on food and get in and get out. Came home and ordered a lot of the other things off Amazon. No problem. Now I looked on Amazon last night and canned vegetables are end of April. So a lot of these choices, you know, with increased awareness, with increased spread of the virus, we have less behavioral choices about this. Yeah. So that's where we have to start looking at what we can change personally, which I've alluded to is like limiting how often you, the frequency with which you go out and how many places you go and acknowledging that this is an important behavioral choice. And as I've told some of our patients, they're so good at be lifestyle changes in other areas of their life. This is not something they've encountered. No. But so, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. And, and I know they have the capability to, when I work with people, we talk about long-term goals and short-term, like little action steps for that week. I know they're capable of it because they've, done it in other areas, but this is a new area that we have to wrap our head around the social distancing. It does. And, and for example, I mentioned uh, one of the couples you worked with out shopping three different places for groceries in a week because they felt they needed their, uh, their fresh vegetables. Well, fresh vegetables are important for a lot of diets, but right now, it's again, it's easy to uh, to forget the priorities right now. The biggest risk is uh, COVID-19 and full disclosure. Since I shopped 10 days ago, we have no vegetables, not even canned vegetables or frozen vegetables in our house. I thought I still had some canned green beans. Well, maybe if one can left, or we have one can of diced tomatoes, mm. but we have some oranges that somebody mailed to us One a of couple our weeks ago. Sent me some blood oranges. So, so that is our fresh fruit. Um, but we're not running out to rectify that problem. We're choosing the social isolation over it. So another thing to do when you buy, you may <clears> have to, and this is what we're doing. We're eating less of the food items. We're kind of, this is what I'm doing. I'm cooking one meal, cutting it in half and putting it away for the next night. I've lost a few pounds. Um, now this may, you know, I don't advocate that for everyone because obviously we work with patients with sarcopenia who have lost muscle mass, lost weight. I'm not saying this is one size fits all, but especially like fresh vegetables, um, you may want to kind of spread them out. Yep. So I keep smiling because I'm reminded of the debate and some of the back and forth that you and I've had. For example, <clears throat> We did the uh, we did the Orlando event. What was that? The thirty first, twenty eighth, I think. Twenty eighth, and yeah, that's right. It was um, last day in February. So, uh, some of my friends who were getting started on the uh, on the testing program started giving me some information. I was able to start focusing on this issue, and I remember going out to dinner that night and saying, "Look." we may end up having to batten the hatches. This is, uh, think of it as a, um, as a hurricane coming through. And, you know, we've had to leave, leave uh, Kiowa when the hurricane came through. Batten the hatches, isolate, uh, get at a place where you're safe. But this is obviously gonna last a lot longer than the hurricane. And so I went, mate, I went right into hurricane mode as soon as I got home. You took the flight, I took the car. <laughs> And uh, you wanted to argue with me about my family and I, I wanted to argue with you about buying groceries. We have very different uh, habits in terms of food. And I think that created some of this. Meaning, I, meaning it took you three more days to get home. Right. When you say about his family. Right. Because he was so hard on me about groceries. So I reminded him he traveled <laughs> three days longer than I did. Well, I was doing. I was glad he saw his family. And, and I was doing two to four hours a day of this stuff. I will so say we kind of got out. lost going home and almost got to Atlanta and went backward to South Carolina. <laughs> so there is that little small item. 
Well, you know, maybe too much multitasking. But anyhow, <laughs> the point that I was trying to make was um, we have different shopping and eating characteristics. You're eating a lot more carbs. You uh, wanted to have more carbs, breads, things like that around, which, uh, which need to be fresh. On the other hand, I'm eating a lot fewer carbs. And when we go shopping, you go in and go straight to the place that you want. Meanwhile, I sort of usually used to pre COVID would sort of do around meander, look at cheeses, look at things like that. Uh, the other thing I do in shopping is I've always been set up or for years, I've been set up with, uh, uh, recurrent delivery for some things out of Amazon. So, I've got like four or five bottles of avocado oil or canisters of avocado oil um, available in our grocery, I mean, in our um, pantry. So I, I made a decision early on. I'm going to be ending, I'm going to be living off of uh, olive oil and avocado oil as a major source of calories, maybe for the next couple of months. That didn't strike you as, as very appetizing. So no, and we've you had eaten a different some, perspective. And we've eaten some two-year-old canned beans because he buys so much <laughs> in a head. And I usually don't eat his food that is that old, but I was glad to make a white chicken chili with it. <laughs> and I survived the two-year-old canned beans. So These are white beans, by the way. Yeah, white beans. White bean, canned chili, I mean, uh, chicken chili. It was great. We loved it. And I will say another thing is we do eat out quite a bit. And so I am definitely, yeah, well, no, in the past, before pre-COVID-19, we would eat out several times a week. So this is new for me to have to cook this much. And I do want to bring up meal uh, restaurant takeout. I know a lot of people are opting for that option, but we ourselves have not chosen to do that, even though the menus look you know, like a great substitute for my cooking, we have decided we don't want the exposure of people cooking and carrying the food either to us or out to the takeout or the delivery. So that's another aspect that we have um, strongly considered with my lack of wanting to cook. I, I never thought about getting any takeout. Yeah. I do miss eating out, but I'm not risking it. And again, with a takeout, you think, okay, I mean, I had one of my viewers say, well, instead of grocery shopping, I get takeout every day. Well, isn't that a lot better than going and spending an hour in the grocery store? Well, no, I mean, every food, every meal, you're getting more takeout and you're, you are very likely to be getting into the, to the breathing space of the delivery person for that food. And it's not even that in terms of my concern, my concern is, who prepared that food? Did they have COVID? Was it on their hands? Or what kind of comfort level do you have regarding that? And so again, I don't, I don't agree with a lot of takeout either. And that's an area where we've agreed. Other areas where we've not been quite in sync has to do with just our family of origin. With my family, we ate more, a lot more at home, and we enjoyed making food and we enjoyed eating food way too much. In fact, you know, my dad was over 350 pounds at one point mm -hmm. in my height. So just way too much of a conversation around internal preparation of food. The, the women uh, tended to make the food and it tended to be a, an expression of love and caring for the rest of the family. And the men had to eat the food or they weren't uh, receiving some of that loving and caring. So some significant challenges there. On the other hand, you, at your family, you you guys liked to eat out a lot more. That was a bigger deal from where you came from. Yeah. So we had to do some some adjustments as as well there. Any other comments? Looks well, like we're slowing down. You had talked about I think staging your Amazon. Did you want to talk about Amazon box? Amazon. I did bring some Amazon boxes here. You want to you want to do that? With gloves on. So uh, we've got some gloves. Um, well, I guess the thing. Here's one of the. Go ahead. There's, there's competing evidence. I'm not going to say that I know the exact answer, but I have read that the virus does not stay on paper or cardboard. Um, 
hard surfaces like glass and plastic, a little more likely. Um, but I've also read that if you're looking to de-stress, the main thing is to think about your own shopping and the time you're spending in the store and the virus you're being exposed to. Now, I did wear gloves to go grocery shopping. Um, I'm trying not to hand my credit card over to anyone. Even I, I haven't done dry, I haven't done an in-person pharmacy since the flu came out in January. I elect drive-through because uh, I've seen enough sick people in line that are going to handle the credit card register. So when I did drive-through at the pharmacy this week, I asked them if I could read my card versus handing it over. Really good tip, and I never would have thought of that. So I guess what I'm trying to say. I am being cautious. I think the credit card, I saw the person in the pharmacy touching their face. Then I saw a line of six cars behind me. Think about how many credit cards are being handled by that one person, perhaps being handed over by sick people. That's called a fomite. Yeah. So I have avoided that. And she did say, I haven't taken anybody's credit card over the, they have like a little intercom or phone, which I did not touch. It's, it's just like, in her ear. So how many people do you think went through that drive through Oh, I don't know. All day. And All day. And day. when she said, I haven't taken anybody's credit card, she meant. I mean, verbally is what I'm saying. She had not taken it verbally, which means every person driving through that, ph uh, that pharmacy awning drive through was giving their credit card. And this right. person who was scratching their nose and yep. touching their face was also a major central processing unit in terms of their hands for everybody's credit card that was driving through that unit. Yeah. So very, very good point. Now, again, I never would have thought of that. I'm avoiding. So when I shopped in the grocery, I took my glove off to get my credit card out of my purse and use it without touching the machine itself. And I used my glove hand to punch the buttons. I think there's just ways you, you have to think about it logically. And some of you may think this is overkill. But it's almost like, again, with a health behavior, you have to give it a little thought because if you just do it without some pre-meditation, you're not going to think of those things. You know, when right. you drive up to the pharmacy, there's an urgency. There's people behind you. So I had already thought about the fact I was not, I was going to ask if I could read the number out. Um, so when you go to all this cleaning, you know, that we've heard some people do about groceries, et cetera, I think there's other areas like this credit card at the pharmacy to me takes precedence. And it's a really good point as your husband, number one, I do this kind of stuff for a living and I wouldn't have thought about it. Number two, you and I had just gotten through our debates on whether we should grocery shop or whether we shouldn't. And so we had some emotion flaring up on that. So it's really hard for me not to discount it. And in fact, I tried my first reaction emotionally was to discount it. You know, that we're, we're just playing tit for tat here. And uh, it was actually a very, very good point. So, know, we got to bury our ego and yeah. and start dealing with realities. So I can tell now, you what we're doing. When we bring the groceries in, we're not putting it on the counter. We have an eye cooking aisle where we, you know, have cutting boards, et cetera. We're putting it on like a cocktail table and unloading from there. We are not washing every can. We're not doing any of that. Uh, again, I'm not telling you what to do about that. That you can read up on and make your own decision. There's a lot of conflicting evidence about yeah. it. So, but we are staging. Yeah, we are staging with Amazon. Um, instead of bringing them in, I leave the boxes in the garage for about a week. And then... Uh, some, some of the viewers might... Go ahead, finish out. And then I'm opening it... Uh, well, the first time I waited two weeks, and then Ford was saying he was running low on his little supplements that he puts in his coffee every morning, all 10 of them. And <laughs> so I decided I'd open up the boxes on trash day, um, so, which I did out in the garage actually. Some of you may remember this, Betaine or Betang, it's the methyl group replenisher um, for those of us, especially taking niacin. Um, you, some of you have seen Chris Masterjohn's uh, detailed focus on it. So I ran out of that, I ran out of my uh, Jim Nima, uh, my powder, powdered Jim Nima, which is my secret weapon against my uh, 
sugar or my sweets addiction. I'm not, I haven't had sugar, much sugar in a long time, but I do use non nutritive sweeteners. Uh, my wild cocoa, you know, the wild dark chocolate powder. I'm trying, pushing that in front of your face here. Let me put that back here. So we got these things, but they've been here for what, two weeks now? Yes. Is that right? Yes. And I made his and her piles so he can bring that his in when he <laughs> has an urge to do so. I'm letting and, mine stage a little longer. And I don't know if you can see that. That's the stuff that we all love to hate, natto powder. You know, K2 coming in from uh, uh, from natto powder, a supplement with uh, K2 with uh, both pills and with the powder itself. This little picture is fermented uh, beans. Again, almost anything you can begin if you if you force yourself to eat it for a month, you begin to like not this stuff. This stuff is really bad. Now, some people have said, uh, "Yeah, I can." Uh, I can begin to um, to develop a taste, but it's still for me the taste you hate once a day. Now, I, so all of these came in. We we staged them for what two weeks? Yeah, it was. They were out in the garage for a good while, maybe one to two weeks, ten days to two weeks. Okay, so we've got our little uh, Windex, which is by far your favorite cleaner. Ever since you watched, was this since you watched my? Big fat Greek wedding, or did you? <laughs> or think, did you bring this? I think that was the, a familiar. Marriage? I think that was a familial thing. Okay, so <laughs> uh, is this is this an adequate cleaner for um, for COVID related stuff and packages? Uh, a lot of people would say no. I don't know if that has alcohol in it or not. That says this vinegar. actually doesn't. This one's a vinegar. It's a vinegar uh, based and alcohol. It's supposed to have what seventy percent alcohol at least I for think hands. So. Again, this is not something we've been doing ourselves. And I just want to bring up another point in terms of anxiety about this whole thing. I think you need to make the, the behavior changes that are the most pivotal in terms of not socially isolating. And what do you think those are? Well, like I said, not going out to the grocery more than once every two weeks, not going to multi -store, multiple stores, um, not spending hours in places where other people have been breathing the yeah, air. Try to get in now 30 line. minutes, shop at the opportune times. You can decide for yourself. I, one of our patients did tell me something that even Trader Joe's advocated. Wash all those cloth bags in your washing machine with hot water, mm. which I thought was interesting. But these other behaviors in terms of washing cans, you know, washing plastic, I think that's a personal choice. I think the biggest point that I, and I think you would agree with me, is the social isolation. Yeah, no question. Not the breathing cans, other people's air. Not the plastic. Um, but that's what's you know. It's like there's a hierarchy of infectious strategies. You know, they. And pardon me again. I, I get graphic sometimes because I'm a doctor and an epidemiologist. Yeah, sexually transmitted diseases. If you're an epidemiologist, by definition, something that's sexually transmitted is not going to be breathed in the air. It's not going to be uh, a fomite type of thing. People say, I got it from the toilet seat. We know that's not the case. In other words, you have to have very specific, very active uh, changes of body fluids. On the other end of the spectrum, you have diseases like this, COVID and measles. You walk in a room, you breathe the air, it's uh, droplets. It, well, it's more than droplets. There's a, a, some distinction here. Um, droplets tend to come out, they'll go maybe a few feet and you get more fomite type of transmission that way. Aerosol will stay in the air for hours. Mm. And so you remember when you went to the grocery store, you snuck out early and you thought I wasn't going to catch you, but you went. <laughs> it, it, at least you did do the right thing in yeah. terms of going early in the morning. Yeah. But as I said, yeah, there's that same air with those same viruses was still in there from last night. So that's the difference. Um, if something is transmitted so easily as breathing air that someone else, an infected person breathed an hour or 10 hours ago, then 
you don't have to shake hands. You don't have to have sex. You don't have to do any of those kind of things. You just have to breathe the air. And that's what's going to transmit the disease. Yeah. So, yes, for this disease, it's breathing the sharing air with other people that have breathed it. Yeah, I think that's the number Big one issue. priority. And I think if adding other things like cleaning every can good increases your anxiety, think about what this priority is. And I'm not suggesting you shouldn't clean cans, but I'm suggesting that you think about how this is transmitted and what the priority is. Um, did you want to go to questions? Yeah, you want to do some questions here? Uh, Bill Fox. I'm cloudy on how even a totally in shape immune system can help against COVID-19 given that we have no immunity to the virus. What am I missing? Well, think about it logically, Bill. Uh, kids 10 years old and less get the same exposure to the virus. They haven't been exposed to it in the past either, but they're not dying. It's the, it's the adults, the, uh, the middle agers, people with other risk factors. So by definition, and just look at the logic, it's crystal clear that the immune system is a big deal for this. I think the real question is, is something like vitamin C and uh, some of the other supplements we talked about, or that's one of the critical questions in terms of this, are vitamin C and those others enough to boost that immune system, especially for somebody who already has risk factors. You get to other questions about this immune system function thing, BCG, the um, international uh, TB uh, uh, vaccine that boosts the immune system. And there's a lot of research going on in, in that space right now. So Loretta Dillingham said you're having to go to bed because you live in Australia, but be evidently got back up. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, Dr. Brewer, I just saw this. You may wish to remove it from the comments after you've seen your seen it yourself. It's an impassioned plea by a hospital doctor in Madrid. Hmm. I haven't seen that. Jackie uh, Shaheen, I, I've been subscriber for months. Thank you for everything. Well, thank you for your interest, Jackie, and that's why we do it. Uh, Bart, hello, Bart Robinson. Hope everybody's safe and well. We do too. Uh, Jackie Shaheen, Zoom US crashing a lot. Yeah, I finally got my uh, Sunday school class to agree to do Sunday school class by Zoom this past Sunday. We got that to work. Uh, a little bit of a rush trying to get ready for the YouTube live that we did that again, my dear wife suggested that I now start doing every day. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't choose the time. <laughs> you didn't choose the time and you did call it fireside chats. Claude and I actually got a picture of a fireplace mm -hmm. and it just didn't fit. So we didn't use it. But well, right after that first Sunday school class using zoom, Clyde and I got on and Zoom would not work for us. Again, it's just uh, too, too much new space. Everybody's going Zoom now. And, and there's gonna be a lot of good that comes out of this, uh, just like there's a lot of good that comes out of a lot of things. And this one is, we're gonna start getting a lot more used to things like uh, telemedicine, remote medicine. If there's any generation that needs more access to health care. It's the boomer generation. But if there's any generation alive right now that's not used to it, not ready for it, it's the boomer generation. So and I just I, I just made my first telemedicine appointment with a doctor. I just had my first telemedicine appointment with a doctor this morning. And it sounds like he wasn't used to doing those before either, was he? I don't I don't think so. It's so but interesting. He did it rather quickly. He got it up and running rather quickly. I'm a doc. I've supervised docs for a living, done this over 35 years. This is not the first, uh, this generation, this is not the first time telemedicine happened. As soon as telephones were invented, doctors and patients were using them to communicate. It's just. Well, he's a specialist and I think, you know, it's not like MD Live where you're doing non-emergency medical care. Right. So I thought, I applaud him for doing it as a specialist. Oh, I do too. I applaud anybody that's finally breaking that behavior pattern and starting to, to use this. Now you were pointing out something, Janice. What Somebody about temperature. Oh, okay. T.W. Wright, good, good morning, excuse me, from Oklahoma. Thank you, T.W. David Ivers, good morning, Dr. Brewer. 
on Jackie Shaheen, five minutes from the Duke Medical Center. So they're starting to sterilize and reuse masks. Kevin McCord, Dr. McCord, the uh, a great preventive medicine doc just uh, south of Cincinnati. Is it possible that anosmia results from the combined effects of viral inf infection and chronic underlying zinc deficiency? I don't know, uh, Kevin. I don't, I, I haven't dug that deep into it, but I do think that anything that creates uh, mucus and irritation in those in that space. Let me go back and do a quick share uh, for those of us who are not totally clear on the anosmia connection. I, I think some of that might be fairly obvious and that is, look, uh, you're, you smell through receptors right here. Again, that's the quickest easiest uh, way from the outside of our body into the brain. Um, and if you have irritation there, inflammation, it's, and mucus, it's a great way to block those, those receptors. So let me go back out. Great question though. It'd be interesting to see what that looks like in the, uh, as the information becomes more available. So Donald Farmer, on the issue of children and fever, is that the one you were talking about? You mentioned earlier. It was, it was up higher, but that's okay. Well, that's one of the problems. You, you get these things, you get these questions, they get built up and you click on it and it just mm -hmm. shoots. It. Okay, so is there evidence that fever turns on certain parts of the immune system? <clears throat> well, actually, uh, it's a good question and it's sort of the opposite. The immune system is what turns on the fever. You, you release some uh, leukin, uh, interleukins and cytokines and some things that some signals that tell the body to create fever. It also tells the body to get real tired, slow down, so the body can redirect uh, energy over into the immune system to fight that disease. Also, might fever play a role in breaking down the virus? Well, again, I, I don't fully, I'm not as a good enough physiologist to know exactly what fever does. I know that many of us felt like fever clearly did help us um, uh, work on, uh, on infections. Supermarket, Shaheen, <clears throat> excuse me. Supermarket warehouses are empty. Uh, well, our son works at a grocery store and he said it's starting to slow down quite a bit. And I'm not seeing these, these things on the internet about as well, much of that. And by slow down, the warehouses have more goods and the crowd has slowed down Yeah, and we're building more, um, uh, stock again in yeah. the groceries. But again, this would, you know, vary throughout the country. We can only speak for Kentucky. We have to buy what we can find. I go every day trying to get stock for three months. Hmm. I'd reconsider that. I would, I, 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 right now is the key part of the hidden transmission going on, uh, no matter where you are in the U.S. I would try to hunker down for another two to four weeks if possible and uh, minimize exposure. The question earlier, let me just kind of paraphrase it. It was about the outdoor temperature, the climatic temperature. Oh, that's a, okay. You want me to and I think it was, how was that relevant to Amazon boxes? But I know a lot of people have asked about outside, you know, when the temperature goes up. Yeah, so two or three things. Um, a common uh, misperception is that this is going to go away when summer hits because at least in the northern climes you don't have the flu uh, epidemics tend to go away when the summer hits. Uh, don't count on that. Number one, you do actually get flu transmission during the summer months. Number two, during the um, uh, in the tropics there is no flu season. It just keeps transmitting. Uh, number three, you look at Thailand, they've gotten, they got slammed with this and their weather was very hot. So hot weather is not going to save us. Um, then you start getting into some question about, well, if I live in the desert and it's 90 degrees and my Amazon package has been sitting out, does that help? Uh, I haven't seen a whole lot that said, that's saying that 90 degrees is going to wipe out your uh, your 
your uh, virus, your viral load on the on the package. Richard Lund, present, persistence of neutrophils in the lung tissue seems to exacerbate the inflammation. Well, clearly, yes. Um, this is the, this whole thing. The killer part of this disease is inflammation in the lungs, and um, that's what this whole part of we talked earlier about the if. I don't know if you were on earlier, we, we talked about, if you look at the x-rays of everybody getting COVID uh, or just the viral infection, even if asymptomatic, totally no symptoms, they're still very, it's still very common to see what we call ground glass uh, findings in the chest x-ray. And that ground glass finding is basically inflammation in those alveoli, the small air sacs in the lung. So that is what's killing people. Products of NF, K, uh, K beta activation or other pathways causing the persistence. Richard, that one's got, gotten a little bit above uh, or deeper than my uh, level of knowledge. I think it's a, it's a good question. And Richard's getting into the actual uh, cellular uh, response and the different types of cyto uh, cytokines and uh, um, messaging molecules within the body that are that are tied up and and the actual actors within this inflammatory mechanism cranium lost i agree with jackie i'm new york city normal things you you can't find are basics ed eggs bread soap tissue canned goods some of us have to go every day uh, mm, that's bad when you got to go every day especially in new york right now but I, I don't think it's safe to go uh, every day anywhere in the U.S. right now because we are in the hockey stick phase. I mean, this is the crunch time, the next two to four weeks. OAG, good to talk to you. Glad to see you here. Dr. Brewer, I read an article written by a doctor that the COVID-19 first incubates in the sinus for three days before moving to the lungs. Do I have any thoughts on this? I don't. I've seen conflicting information saying that, you know, it's really starting down in the lower respiratory tract. I don't know yet. Cranium loss, Jackie Shaheen's comment about mark, uh, shopping in New York City. Many markets are closed now. Physical distancing, please. That Z50, that's, uh, that's our friend Joe Riley. Janice, you may, may remember Joe. Not social distancing, physical distancing. Yep, I think a lot of people are starting to wrap their head around it. We're, and that's why Zoom is taking off and crashing because we're realizing that there are remote ways to, um, to continue our social interaction. Our governor calls it healthy at home. Yes, it's a very good phrase. And that's a positive, upbeat way of saying stay home. Our governor here in Kentucky has been a great, he's been a great influence. And Janice is very positive about our governor. She won't let me get beyond five o'clock without running down to watch our governor's fireside chat. And we don't watch any TV. So that is a new thing in our household. Greg Clopton. I hope this isn't re repetitive logged in late, but there is, but there is a very interesting article in the journal of virology on colonization of CNS. No, it isn't. I haven't seen that. Very interesting. Thank you. Andrew Holt. Our pastor has told everybody not to shake hands. Thank goodness. So hopefully we're going to see a lot more of that. Maybe an elbow bump. Janice, I bet you're going to, I didn't see you roll your eyes. You get really frustrated about elbow bumps. You want to make a comment about that? Elbow bumps are not six feet apart. Yeah, it's hard to be six feet apart and bump elbows unless you've got very long arms. Um, we're now live streaming. And to, to your pastor's credit and your credit too, you said maybe an elbow bump if you really have to. And that's my, that's my question. Janice's question, do you really have to? Hello, Nasir, Nassar, Ahmed. Glad you're enjoying the blood oranges. Thank you very much. <laughs> we are. And as I said, because of my low diet, I haven't had oranges in years. Those things were really, really good from San Diego. And we had, what, maybe two dozen? Mm -hmm. And they've lasted us a couple of weeks We so are far. parceling them out. Really? We each get half an orange every other day. <laughs> since we don't have any fresh fruit and, fruit and veggies. Joseph Page, I was worried I got the virus at an airport, but am totally asymmetric. I think you meant asymptomatic. 
Would two weeks self-quarantine with no symptoms be enough time to guarantee they could not spread the virus to others? Well, a guarantee is a very strong word, Joseph. I, 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 here's the thing. If you look at that first, uh, it was a New England Journal article coming from the guys, the docs in China with the first cases. Here was the best that they could figure out. Uh, the average uh, incubation period, in other words, time from infection to new symptoms was five and a half days. 95% of uh, people, if they were going to show symptoms, showed symptoms within 12 and a half days. So if you're looking for a guarantee, you've got, you still got 5% left after 12 and a half days, Joseph. So there you go. How long do you guys think this will last? Oh boy. At the end of the day, uh, I know a lot of people are uh, Tony Fauci haters, but he, he did have a good comment. At the end of the day, we're not going to determine the timeline on this. The virus will. But that's not really what you're asking. What you're asking is how long do we think it'll last? The next two weeks, I think, are going to be significant, real crunch time for transmission. We in the U.S. have been transmitting it, uh, at least in hotbeds like New York, for a while, for at least a couple of weeks and did not know it. Now we know it. We live in Lexington, Kentucky. We have cases throughout the, the state now. So if you say, well, every one of those cases uh, represents, what, a dozen, two dozen, five dozen people that are infected. How many cases in, in Lexington and Kentucky right now? It's over 200 now. Okay. So over 200, and how many people in the state of Kentucky? I don't know. So, there. I mean, we we see that hockey hockey stick going up, but what is it? How many cases in the U.S. It, the U.S. took took uh, they were like in the high 80s at this point. We'll go over to the Bing map. Um, U.S. is 80. Well, okay, mid 80s right now. Now here's the thing. And that is a very easy app to look at, Bing app. Did you explain that previously? I it's did. B-I-N-G. And you can look up a country. You can look up a city. Yeah, you can look up a state within the United States and get up to the minute updates, supposedly. Yeah. yeah. So let's get back to what took us down that this path. How, how much longer is this going to happen, do I think? Well, here, let's think about it. Yeah, we're back on a hockey stick again huge increase, which means we've had a lot of transmission going on then. But what's going on now? We've got the U.S. is now number one, 84,000 cases. Well, let's say there are 10 people uh, infected for every case, which would mean just less than a million people infected. How many people are there in the United States? 300 million. Okay. So uh you know at some point we are going to start getting wrapping our head around social distancing so i mean if we had no social distancing i mean this could rip through for another month or so with social distancing it's going to i think it's going to be significantly longer so those of us who are saying this is going to be over in two weeks two weeks is very important because not because it's going to be over but what's going to happen is uh, Main Street America, like, like Lexington and all of these areas in the middle part of America, are going to begin to realize, no, this is not a China problem. This is not an Italy problem. This is not an Iran problem. It's not a New York problem. This is a Main Street America problem at this point. And uh, if I want to be able to get my place on an ICU respirator, I need to stay here until a lot of this first wave is burned through. And that brings us back to personal behavioral choices because not all states like our state have closed non-essential businesses. So there is still, it varies state to state. So there is a lot of individual behavior to choose that physical distance, social distance when it's not enforced. Yep. And that's the importance of that. So I'm going to go through a couple more. We're getting kind of long in the tooth on this. We've been going for about an hour. 
Uh, Gerard Cook, people should understand the distinction between social and physical distancing. Very, very good point. Thank you for reminding us. Uh, Z06, Apple Pay stores only. Um, ate my homemade natto while I watched. Uh, Richard <laughs> actually makes natto. And I think he likes it. It's like, wow. Oh, can't wrap my head around that. Chichi Wawa. Chichi Wawa. I get COVID-19 from someone, if I get COVID-19 from someone touching my credit card, will I get full blown case or milder case of the virus? That is actually a very, very good question. It keeps coming up in terms of questions and frequently asked questions. It does not seem like I could get that much virus from someone touching my credit card. All you need is one. And people say, well, am I gonna get worse disease if I get hit with more. In other words, I'm in an area with a lot of people and I and inhale a lot more. Here's what's going to happen. Your body is going to incubate this virus. What happens is it only takes that one, that one infects your cell membrane. It hijacks the uh, genetic material mechanisms within that one cell. Mm -hmm. And then instead of your cell making your proteins, it's now making more viruses. It releases those, and then you've got thousands of them in your bloodstream, all of which go to new cells. And then you get each of those cells now creates thousands more. So if you get a huge dose of this, you're just gonna get mm -hmm. to that um, critical period of viremia, huge amount in your bloodstream earlier. It's not like, it's going to create, I, I haven't seen any significant difference. And we typically don't in infectious diseases because of the way that the mechanism goes. You know, it only takes one. If you get hit with a lot more up front, it's just a, sh a shorter incubation period. But if you just, you get hit, get hit with fewer, it just takes a little bit longer. Either way, you're going to reach um, um, saturation point. And then at some point, hopefully your antibodies and your immune system will kick in. So, oh my goodness, my phone has been sending messages from my pocket. I'm sorry, I hope it was only gibberish. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> OAG said, yes, you're right, it was gibberish. I wasn't sure what you were doing, so I did block it. <laughs> uh, from, interesting, I had no idea that, a, very interesting. You, you know what was happening. No. Her, she had this on her phone. Okay. And it was like a pocket call, except it was a pocket comment on, oh. on here. <laughs> so Mike Martyr, frozen fish delivered in boxes is impossible without wearing latex gloves and running the packages under warm soapy water. Otherwise you're a freezing virus. You know, uh, interesting, I forgot where I saw it, but I saw some recent information about maybe not this virus, but maybe some other coronaviruses not really being killed by freezing. So interesting point. Um, you, do you have anything else you want to respond to, Janice? If not, I'm going to say, you know, we've got too many more questions that we can handle. We'd have to go for another long time. No. Again, I think that, you know, the salient points, even if you're wearing gloves, some people are even wearing a mask to the grocery store. Don't feel like that's a free ticket to shop as often as you want. You still want to limit your visits and kind of zoom in and out with some thought out process of what you're going to buy, what you can buy online, um, you know, prioritize if you're living alone or with a partner, the choices you're going to make if the choices aren't available, can you substitute versus going to another store? Um, I, I think it's those um, behaviors that require some forethought that will make the difference. I do too. One other quick comment. Um, Chi Chi Wawa, I heard that wearing a mask will cut down on your exposure by 50 to 80%. Doesn't that make it worth wearing a mask? Again, if you go back to what we were just talking about regarding how big the dose is of the virus that you get. So you get a much lower dose and maybe you prolong the, uh, the incubation period a few days. And there's a plea, our healthcare providers don't have masks. Right, donate it when you can. Thank you again for your interest. And 
um, hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. Thank mm -hmm. you.